Episode 135, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. In today's expert, I'm delighted to have Dr. Douglas Frigo. Dr. Frigo is a recently retired DPC physician, and he's one of the pioneers of the DPC movement. He's certainly been one of the best advocates for the movement as he runs the DPC News website. He's also been a prolific writer on authentic medicine, where he's been blogging for almost 20 years, I believe. And today we're going to talk about Apple. And basically, tech in general, or tech companies, I suppose, to be more precise, and how they've entered the primary care space and have flopped. Why have they flopped? And what's the real solution to fixing the problems? You can guess what his ideas are, but I think you're going to have a lot of fun this discussion. We talk about how you just can't replace people with technology. And speaking of people, I'd like to welcome Dr. Urta Asta, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm so sorry if I didn't, uh, who's a new patron. And join the Paradox family, you can go to patreon.com slash the Paradox. That's P-R-A-D-O-C-S. And for a small monthly contribution, you can support the production and promotion of the show. And you can interact a little more easily with me, you know, give me show ideas, and possibly even get on the show. So join the Paradox family today at patreon.com slash the Paradox. But now a word from our sponsor. And today's sponsor is Physician Financial Services, a business widely recognized in the physician community for disability insurance. Lawrence B. Keller, CFP, has been in the insurance and financial services industry since 1990. Unlike medicine, which has a standardized path that physicians must take to gain the education, training, and experience requirements necessary to obtain board certification, the insurance and financial services industry does not. While he might not be a doctor's first phone call regarding their insurance needs, he is often their last. Find Larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash Larry Keller or at the link in the description of the show. Finally, if you haven't subscribed to the show, what are you waiting for? It's free. Hit the subscribe button in the podcast player of your choice. And if you haven't, what are you waiting for? It's free. So be sure to hit that button and go back into the archives if you haven't had a chance to listen to all the shows. I'm sure there's one or two that will pique your interest on topic other than COVID or TBC. We strive here to find solutions and people are disruptive who actually solve problems and not just point out the problems in medicine. So I like to think we have a nice balance of both. But without further ado, how Apple failed at healthcare, doctors didn't, with Dr. Doug Farrego. Enjoy. Well, hey, I'm here with my new friend, Dr. Doug Farrego. He's a family physician who is now recently retired as of October, but he's a, he was a direct primary care physician at Forest Direct Primary Care, uh, which he started in 2014 in Forest, Virginia. He'd worked for a number of other jobs in, I guess we'll call it corporate medicine for lack of a better explanation, up in uh, the Northeast. He's also written six books, The Official Guide to Starting Your Own DPC Practice, The Direct Primary Care Doctor's Daily Motivational Journal, and Slowing the Churn in Direct Primary Care. He invented a couple things like the knee saver, which you see the catchers wear if you watch baseball, it's in the Hall of Fame. He also invented the cryo helmet for head injuries and migraines. He was the editor and creator of the Placebo Journal, which is sort of a humor magazine journal, I guess, uh, from 2001 to 11. He's been blogging since blogs began in, two, in early early 2000s at Authentic Medicine. He's currently the editor of, and, of the DPC News website, which can be found at dpcnews.com. And he also helped found the DPC Alliance. So clearly this is a guy who's an advocate for direct primary care. <laughs> Dr. Frigo, thanks for joining the show. I am. And yeah, you're welcome. Love to be here. Anything we can do to push that ball uh, or that boulder up the hill up to DPC, I, I'm, I'm always there. Well, I have loved direct primary care physicians for a number of reasons. One is they're super easy to get on the show because they always have time. <laughs> it's, yeah, you talk right. To most, right. Most docs you talk to like, well, if I take myself, for example, I've got, you know, hours where I'm working and I can't, can't make schedule time in. 
I'm not in primary care, so I'm you know beholden to an operating room, and so that's probably always going to be the case, even if I were to do some other way. But uh, direct primary care docs, they say, oh, okay, I'll just pencil an hour this time or whatever, and I'm not super busy. I'll just not have to see patients for a little while, and it's pretty easy for them. And um, and also, they are all very happy. I mean, I've now maybe oh, I'm just wow. finding happy ones, but yeah, they they are. Um, there is definitely the the push to be in business, and then they're you know running a practice, but there's a lot of the things that are outside their control. I think that's, I think that's a, one of the big selling points of direct primary care that at least these physicians feel like they are more in control of their, of their practice and how they work than they are in most other settings. I hundred percent agree. And they're passionate and they want to, they want to spread the word. So that's why they'll get on podcasts too. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't care so much about your topic, why would you want to talk about it on a podcast? Right. If you just wanted to see your patients and go home, which a lot of doctors who are in the industrialized matrix model um, don't want to talk about it, right? And then they're burning out and frying where uh, DPC doctors are always want to talk about it because they want to convert the masses. Yeah, right. Well, we're going to talk about a couple of articles that you've written recently that are going to be on the paradox.com website. You can go to paradox.com for episode 135. Uh, so first, it's the one that you wrote in Apple, which I thought was very interesting. Why don't you kind of talk to us about Apple, which everyone knows the brand Apple and it's a technology company. And they thought, well, we have all these devices. We have all these ways of capturing data, right? Everyone out in Silicon Valley says we have lots and lots of data. And so there's a lot of useful things you can do with data and there are lots of things that are not very helpful. So why don't you talk about Apple's foray into medicine? Well, first, I'm not an expert in data. I'm not an expert in Apple. And I, this article is in the Wall Street Journal, but it was another, it's just a similar theme that I saw all the time. Uh, that Silicon Valley and big tech's gonna, just going to solve healthcare, ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> it's just not. It's an adjunct, right? Big tech's or technology is an adjunct to what we do, and they want to replace us. Remember, the goal is always to replace physicians. I don't know, consciously, subconsciously, financially, whatever. Even though we're the smallest percentage of what's using of of, of uh, healthcare dollars is is physicians, you would think, oh, it's a big slice. It is not, right? They still want to replace us because it's corporate and the world thinks they, no, they're smarter than us too. So if you read the Wall Street Journal article or my article on DPC News, you know, Apple says that we're going to do it with our Apple employees. We'll just kind of have a subscription model using our, our data and uh, we'll get another doctor, you know, I think I forget his name, but he was going to run it and that thing blew apart. I mean, it never worked. The engagement was low by uh, employees because they, were, they weren't paying and their skin wasn't in the game. The doctors, and if it was doctors, and there was turnover, their skin's not in the game. And it just shows again why direct primary care is the way to go. Um, you can't replace doctors. I'm sorry. You're going to, you know, we can, they're going to try, but they can't do it. Now, I think their tech is interesting, but, you know, sometimes I, I point out in my article too, not all data means crap. I mean, actually a lot of data is crap, right? It's yeah. just noise. You know, why do I, I, my, I, I love my son to death, but he wants to, capture his blood pressure and every day and like, dude, you're 20 something years old, right? I don't need to know. And you know, one needs to know that data, right? I mean, you imagine, uh, I would bet you the false positive of anything wrong on people, especially young and healthy is tremendously high. And so what data is important? Uh, well, it looks like we've been doing medicine for how many years, hundreds of years in this country. And so we kind of know what's how to, how to carve away some of that stuff. And so that, that, that's, it's an adjunct. You can use data. You got to know what to use. And but there's also that face-to-face -face knowing your doctor, that personal relationship which DPC has. And I point out in that in my article too. It's like that's why um, you, when you see these cool doctors like Joseph Bell, who, um, who I think he's in Scotland, who 100, 200 years ago, I forget how many years, but how his absolute uh, uh, skill of observation when people would walk in the room, he would teach other students looking at their fingernails, he can tell what they did, he can tell their limp, he can tell how they held their shoulders, he had every observational skill, he was so phenomenal that one of his students, Arthur Conan Doyle, made Sherlock Holmes after him, right? right. Yeah. So, because, so that's irreplaceable, sorry, it's just irreplaceable. So that's why I don't believe in, I think Zoom and telemedicine is good as an adjunct, but sometimes I need to be in the room with you, and you know, from whether it's a smell or a feel or an observation that you're not going to get through this 2D thing you and I are talking through. So uh, good for them, Apple, they tried. And if they fail, Amazon failed, 
keep going, buddies. You want to keep trying instead of throwing <laughs> money at, uh, I mean, if they, they literally could throw money, a little bit of money and start a DPC practices around the country so quickly. I mean, forward is that DPC clinic in LA, right? You've heard about forward. I no, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. So they're a corporatized corporate uh, DPC. Now they okay. have 11 clinics and they had $50 million investment in, in 11 clinics. 50 million. It cost me 20,000 to start my clinic. <laughs> Most profitable in a year. When yeah. you got your own skin in the game and you and you care about your patients and you care about making this thing successful, you don't need 50 million bucks, uh, you know, per, or 5 million per clinic. So I just think it's funny. I, I always like to point that out. Um, not against them if they want to keep trying, but I think the little guys and the grassroots uh, movement is the way that's going to hopefully break this healthcare system and in a way save it. Yeah. So looking back at the Apple, you know, uh, essentially what they were looking at is they they have, as you know, people have Apple watches or yep. devices. It records your blood pressure, like you said, blood pressure, heart rate, all kinds of things. And so my impression was, is they were trying to get, they basically had a, their employees enroll in this program. They collect all this data and then they have someone interpret this data and decide yep. to act on it. And they charge not that much. I mean, it doesn't sound like it was, but it, but it was the point where it was, it wasn't any useful information, right? Like it's just right. gathering, but because it turns out that most people don't need to get seen if they're not, not sick. Right. I mean, it, right. Well, I, think you, you, I think there's a, there's a, uh, I think they did something called the, their philosophy was that they want to break that. They call it 363 because people only seen twice a year and they want to fill in that 363 days. Yeah. Something like that in that article. Right. Okay. So, but let's just stand back. You and I are both physicians, we stand back and say, okay, wait a minute, hold on. What's, what's the population they're dealing with? What age group? Okay. What's the odds of any of them having hypertension or, or AFib? And, and so what are we looking at here? Right. I mean, so what else is that watch showing? Uh, oxygen, what's, what's the odds of them having desatting? De I mean, none of this data means anything to me right now. Right. I mean, in fact, so, but when I get in front of you as a patient, as a 26 year, a 24 year old, and I, and because of the amount of high tech, social media and, 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 and addiction to tech, I can find the high anxiety and depression that's going on and see that, Yeah, right? right. That's not picked up by, <laughs> tech is causing that and they can't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> and as you think I'm uh, exaggerating, this was a 50% increase in ER visits for people with anxiety and, and depression, especially over COVID, but high tech, that was going on before because of technology, social media and so forth, right? So they're all causing that problem, and yet they think they're going to fix it. Yeah, <laughs> and they can't even pick up the problem they're causing. Well, it seems like a fundamental disconnect in in recognizing. So I, I mean, this is like medicine, right? Like you have to diagnose the the problem before you can just because you have symptoms it doesn't it doesn't tell you what the problem is, right? I mean, someone has a limp. Well, it might be because they have a leg that's shorter than the other because of a bad hip replacement. Right? I mean, there are all kinds of different possibilities. You have yeah. to figure out the actual problem. And so when you see someone say, "Well, healthcare is expensive." Well, we just need to, you know, do this X, Y, or Z. Well, if you're not actually approaching the right, the right diagnosis, your treatment's not going to work. And I think you've seen that with these technology companies. They, they think that one, it's the physician expense that's too is caught driving the care, uh, or the fact that people are not staying healthy. Right? Like if we just did more preventive care, we'd save tons of money. Uh, although probably, if you look on on average, preventive care is more expensive than not doing it. I mean, it's obviously of more value to people to not get sick or have uh, sick well, I problems. Believe in, I mean, we all believe in preventative care. And I think a lot of like direct primary care doctors spent, I mean, much more time than I ever had before talking about diet and, yeah. and bringing processed foods down, bringing carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates down. Uh, and, and actually what was interesting if you look at COVID and who was met, who really got the most sick was probably the metabolically most disturbed um, insulin resistant people. And so, could we have used that time to maybe this is on the side? Could maybe could have used that time to say, hey, listen, guys, we all this country needs to work on our diet better because insulin resistance and, and metabolic syndrome really, those patients did really poorly with COVID. But we all know that's taboo to every dear God talk about COVID. Um, but yeah, so we, we talk about it. And I think uh, uh, preventative care is great stuff. If you have the person in front of you and you know the person and you and during their physical, because I do believe in the physical exam. By the way, they're trying to get rid of the physical exam because they don't feel who they are, which is the people like who is that? The U.S. Preventive Task Force and 
and Cochrane stuff, they always debate whether a physical exam was worth it. And I'll never give up on that or never did because that's how you learn about that person and um, pick up things that wouldn't have been picked up. And if you look at the model, uh, it's models based on cost. So when you look on some of the evidence, um, well, why wouldn't you have physical exam therapy? Because they can't get them all in. Well, we right. could. Yeah. So if you could, and you had the time and it wasn't an expense because it's part of their membership and a very cheap $75 a month membership, you really do pick up a lot of stuff, right? I mean, you know, when you think about you, I, the guy who took over for me, I had a conversation that was really enlightening. I said, you know, why are we, you know, the evidence is not, uh, it doesn't show that you should check for a TSH or thyroid. It's not, the evidence doesn't show that's appropriate for a screening. I'm like, why not? That was because of cost. The cost is so high. It's the only reason because yeah, if you get a yeah. TSH come back at 10, you're hypothyroid. I caught so many people way before they were symptom symptomatic. And so, well, Cochrane and everybody else says, well, it's not, it's not cost effective. Well, what if the cost is 10 bucks? Cause that's what the cost is in our office. That changes the whole game. That changes the whole paradigm. So if you take, if we, and our labs were like that, a CBC is five bucks, you know? And so if you did a CBC and someone's, you know, white count was two out of nowhere, that was worth it. That those kind of things I think, you know, are, are at least debatable. And so, sure. Um, you know, so that's what's cool about direct primary care. You start really start thinking about, okay, well, what labs really be worth my worth it now for patients? And can I, you know, so it versus that whole model that we were taught in the industrialized model is based on a mass cost thing. And now this is much more personalized in, in primary care. Right. So you can yeah. do some of that stuff. And I think the two important points there that you mentioned is one is personalized. And so uh, you're not treating a population. You're not looking over a million people and deciding how many people you need to do a colonoscopies on or something like that. You're looking at the person in front of you and you take into account, you know, what they're worried about, their family history, all those sorts of things that um, you can individualize. And then also the fact that your costs are so different, all those equations, those calculations, like you mentioned, you've totally changed them, right? Cause they say, yep. well, it's not worth, it's a thousand dollars for this test. Well, if you say, well now it costs $10 or my physical exam is free. It takes me two minutes. I'm going to do it anyway. It, right. That's that's right. I and mean, that's the whole thing. The reason they say, well, you know, if we only have 20 minutes to, to for or 10 minutes, really, for a yeah. patient interview, what do we spend our time in? And then you say, well, maybe you don't do the physical exam because you're, you know, you're, you've got a certain amount of time you got. But if suddenly that's not a barrier, well, then obviously you do this thing that's free. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it? Right. And it changes it. So it changes. It really was almost, um, you know, um, it freaked out your mind a little bit. You're like, no, nah, everything's open to me now. Right. That's why it's like the matrix, right? You're out of the matrix, which is, you know, with the system and you start thinking, well, now I can really start talking about, well, let's look into cholesterol. What is the b better cholesterol test? Well, we don't want to do the, 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 the NMR because it's too costly. Is it too costly? No, it's not. It was down like 40 bucks versus the old crappy lipid panel, which was, you know, so now you're really digging deeper and what kind of, you know, and, and so it's great for you as a physician to even learn more and find out more really what we can really help patients and are they at risk versus blanket, a blanket statin for everybody, you know, I mean, so, you know, I mean, I, I just, I just think that that's a really cool thing. So I'm not against even the technology, right? So patients that want to have a, look at heart rate variability intrigues me, right? I mean, I think there's something there. Um, sure, I, if you want to, and, and I can explore that with you with the, as a physician, uh, I can explore continuous glucose monitoring, even if you're not a diabetic, there's some thoughts there. I'd love to be, you know, and patients, but, 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 I'm, but me as a big tech saying, I can fix this with my tech, yeah, you ain't doing that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's certainly interesting thinking about all those things that you can't, that you couldn't do before. So the other thing I want to talk to you about is, and this goes, I, my wife's a pediatrician. So she has all kinds of times she gets patients calling with problems, right? Kid has a fever, sore throat, whatever, ear, you know, pulling on his ear, all the usual sorts of things for pediatrics, which is in many ways I've always thought, and most people do, it's like veterinary medicine for kids, like small children, because they can't tell you what there's, what's wrong with them. You have to sort of use observational skills or physical exam skills, the only way you can actually figure it out, or the history from the parents. And and it's very interesting because there are people who promote telehealth and this, uh, I don't want to say impersonal, but certainly not an established relationship with a certain uh, physician or provider, we'll call it, which I hate that term, but we'll just say that. Um, and without having that personal 
relationship, you don't know that person, obviously. And so someone has a problem, you feel totally different about it, depending on who it is who's telling you the problem, right? So my wife will say many times, like, well, I had this person call me fever. I wasn't worried because she's always calling about fever. This mom's always just kind of worried about it. I just reassured her and she's okay. Or she has someone who's like, yeah, when she thinks her kid's sick, there's something really wrong and I have to come in and see it. And like, I got to see you or I got to see this kid. And that sort of, that sort of uh, differentiation is something you can't get for just like, I don't know. I, there are these services like, you know, 10 bucks a month or something like that. And I, I can't imagine you're getting anything of sig- significant value for that. Except maybe peace of mind if you're some, the kind of person who'll never use it. But I, I don't know. I just, I have a hard time believing that that's going to provide any sort of valuable care that you could get elsewhere. I, I'm a hundred percent on board. I, I agree with you. I mean, first of all, for ten dollars a month, and, and they go up to a little bit more. Who are you paying? Who are, who are those providers? Right. I mean, that's another issue I have. Is you know the uh, issue of I think education and and, and training matter, and I think do- doctors uh, have to be physicians, right? And so, not that there's not a role for a team, but if you're paying people now to mass, not doctors who are now seeing tons and tons of patients on a 2D screen, obligated to give them some medication because they want to give them, you know, that's what these people are paid for. Yeah. Bastard died this, 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 this job, right? So that's not helping medicine. That doesn't, that doesn't create access. It may create access, but it's crappier access. Now, I don't have the answer to make access better for everybody. And I've been asked this before. I just interviewed uh, by a reporter, but like, well, you can't have, there's not enough doctors to do DPC and that there's too many patients. Like, well, that would create more in the long run. It wouldn't happen right away, but in the long run, more medical students actually, most people go into medicine initially in their head. You know, I know you became an anesthesiologist, but a lot of people want to be an all around doctor, but then they realize how much we make and we're seeing 30 <laughs> patients a day and we're making the lowest in the end scan. They don't do it, but we make a little bit more in DPC, maybe the same, but we're really getting to know our own patients. It's a quiet, relaxed environment. When I was in practice, 99% of the time, no patient ever saw another patient in the office, didn't even know I ever see one. It was so relaxed. And it was a nice feeling to get to really do what I was trained or I dreamed of being when I was younger. Um, so yeah, that, that I, I think there's, I think the 2D screen telemedicine is an adjunct. Again, just like the, te- the, the, the watch could be, or the, uh, and, and if you pick the right thing for that watch. Um, uh, could be. So I, I think, I don't believe these services are going to take over. I don't think they're good for medicine. Sorry. And that's going to get some people mad. I mean, I think there's some role for some of them, but not all the time. Um, but it is what it is. If people, it's still patient's choice, but I, I, in my mind, I can't get past the personal connection I have with my patients when I was in practice and to see them in person, um, for that observational, uh, you know, intuitive kind of skill that we were trained and you get from 140,000 visits over my career. Sure. There sure. was, I don't know why I picked up certain things that I would walk in a room and pick up after a while, but you can see why you could learn that by just repetition. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can, I, I see certain people at church. I'm like, boy, I hope I don't have to intubate you. Right. I mean, I immediately you know, recognize <laughs> Yep. There you can see the, the, the blue bloating, you know, I mean, right. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that's what you look for. And I'm sure you're looking at their, uh, how easy to intimate they would. I'm sure looking at their jaw too, right? Oh yeah. And, jaw, like yeah, yeah, the airway. And you know, I shake your hand. I'm checking to see if you've got nice veins in your hand. It's yeah, yeah, I sure. can't even help it, but that's just what happens. Yep. I'm the same thing with moles whenever I'm the, you know, whenever I'm beach or anything like that, I'm like, I cannot, <laughs> You know, I've told more people I've ever met, dude, you got to check that out. You know, I'm a doctor, you know I mean? So, uh, you, and, and I, uh, yeah, so I'm a doctor for life. I get that, but, um, yeah, yeah. So I, again, maybe they'll get better all these, at these things, but, um, I've caught some amazing things out of just nowhere where patients were not coming in for that. And I'm like, what is that? And, you know, whether it's a melanoma on a nail or whatever, right. I mean, like you, we got to, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I think there is traditional medicine. I, I just go go back to the first thing I said, which just can't be replaced. Yeah. Well, I feel like DPC is sort of the red pill for, uh, for primary care. It's, you know, the matrix, like you said it, right. I mean, I think that's, it's a way of certainly getting back to like your roots, I guess. And, and I also 
I've oftentimes thought too, with the amount of paperwork that people do with the computers now, and without a doubt, the amount of clicks or non sort of clinical work you have to do as a primary care physician, we know it's increased. They keep track of these things and it's like about half your time or maybe it's even more than half now that your time is spent non clinically. You know, if you cut that by 40%, you've increased your physician coverage by 40%, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and so the, the shortage oh, is, what, is, what are is they doing maybe less, anyway, what are you, what are they doing all these quality metrics? What, how is that, how has that helped medicine? I don't know, but I know when I have patients come in for anesthesia, I know if whether they wear a seatbelt or not, I can tell you, I don't care. I mean, how, how is it? I mean, we've been doing this to how long now, right? And it was always going to all, well, these quality metrics are going to help healthcare. Hasn't done it all. In fact, it's been proven to not work at all, right? It's only for insurance companies to, to sell that data, right? They, they parcel that out and sell it and make more money off us. Right. Um, it does nothing. What's the one metric they never measure? <laughs> Time with patients. Right. <laughs> They'll never measure that because they don't want to tell anybody that where we spend all the time with patient because we don't have any of that. All we, we do what's called a soap note and in our, e, in our simple EMR. And we spend all this time with patient. I don't do any of this garbage quality metrics. Um, I don't, if someone's coming for, you know, uh, and they're having chest pain, I don't need to be asking about their seatbelt at that moment. Right. So this is stupid stuff that's been added to us by others. And this is why I, I get in trouble for, because I get I go rail against our organizations who agreed to every one of these metrics. Yep, they yep. agreed to every one of these coding things. They've agreed to every one of this EMR stuff. They've obligated us all to it and sold us down the drain for no reason. And now you have burnout. And then guess what? They're the answer to your burnout. They have all these courses now for your burnout. You caused the freaking burnout, right? <laughs> And in fact, we're going to help your burnout. We're going to call it patient res oh, no, resilience. So just take this other extra work course online about resilience or whatever. They have no clue what they're doing. No clue. They've caused it all. And then they want to help fix it. And you got to pay for that. So direct primary care breaks that, that bondage, right? It, it breaks the bonds from that. And you know, there's other stressors in DPC. You got to own your own practice. You got to worry about who's paying the gas bill and stuff like that. Um, but you don't have to worry about the, the metrics, the indicators, the, 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 the billing, the coding, the denials, uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to get this to a level four. If I just buff this chart, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? We've got to that point. Everybody, I, I've done this in my lectures. Every single doctor I know, including myself have lied about the review systems. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, we, we put that whole thing in there that we ask all those questions, please. You've never asked all those questions, right? And if you did it, you did it oh, so fast that it was like an auctioneer. So if you know <laughs> for a fact, right? So, so I, I and that's the, and that's another thing. Review systems not proven as any way that ever helped anybody, right? By sitting there and wailing through a review of systems, it actually gets you off the trail of what's important for that day. So, yeah, I, uh, I this is all we create this crap for ourselves. Our organizations gave the okay to the insurance companies and the government, and, and then we're stuck like that. And then by by going, taking the red pill in DPC, we're out. So you run the DPC News website. You yep. have, I'd say you have a, as much a finger on the pulse of DPC as anyone in the country. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I people oftentimes ask me when I try to tell them what DPC is, they say, well, it's concierge. I say, well, not really. There are some DPC docs who say it's concierge because people understand what that is. Yes. Uh, but it's, you know, membership based. And I, and I understand from a marketing standpoint why some DPC docs do it because in their affluent area, that's what people want. And so, you know, they can call themselves whatever they want as long as you're DPC, I guess, who cares? But what do you think the, where do you think the trajectory is of DPC right now in this country? I mean, my impression is, at least watching all the practices opening up, is that it's not exponential, but it's growing quickly. Would you agree with that? Assessment? It's linear and not exponential, unfortunately. Okay, it needs sure. To be, it needs to be exponential. Um, and I'm doing whatever I can, you know, uh, to help that along. When I started, I didn't want to do, I was retired. And like, I'm like, oh my God, all these articles come out, all these practice announcements, all these tips come out and it's on Facebook, which gets washed down the river like a pebble, you know, and, <laughs> and down the, the, the uh, Niagara Falls. It's gone, right? And so no one's collecting this information I'm like, crap, let me ask. 
I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Does anybody else want to do it? No one wants to do it. I'm like, oh, I'll, I've been doing a blog, my other blog for 20 years. I can, I can set up a website and collect on DPC news, practice announcements, marketing tips, uh, practice tips, uh, DPC docs in the news, politics about DPC. It's pretty easy to do. And we put a piece up every single day because I think I want that. I want this movement to grow more than anything. I, I, I would make, it would break my heart if somehow it got stopped because it's, it's the purest part of family medicine I, that I've ever seen is no, it's not rocket science. It is a membership model, which is kind of a newer thing, but now people are understanding subscription models because everything, Netflix, everything is, yeah. You know, Microsoft Word, you'd buy it once, you'd have it forever. Now you got to pay a monthly fee, right? For a, right. It's something like that. So they're getting that. But I do this when I talk in a lecture. And like, if, it was a, if you had someone in the audience transported from a 1930s doctor in the audience, and the doc up there was uh, lecturing, was talking about all these things called direct primary care, how you, uh, you know, it's, you, you don't have to deal with insurance. Patients have time. They know their doctor. They can go see him at their house. That doctor in the audience in 1930 is like, you know, it's been 90 years. You've not changed a bit because that's what we do, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. what, was, that's what they did. The only thing different is we have some of this technology, um, the, e the texting, the email, and um, and it's a, a, that membership model. But yeah, you bring up the word concierge. Concierge there's an article I do in um, we have on the site that explains the difference, and it's not so simple. If you're billing insurance, you're not direct primary care, right? Right. If you're, and then there's a there's a I actually use the term in my uh, marketing because I was early. I said there's concierge care at an affordable price. Oh, okay. It, you know that's the way because people understand that concierge service, right? I don't love that. I don't love concierge because it does sound you know for the rich. So that's why I added the affordable price thing. But then that beg, begs a difference. If you have a, we can't define like, where is there a, a, a cutoff point? We were about $75 a month. So if someone said $1,000 a month, well, that's obviously concierge medicine. So, but, but then where does it meet? So where you cross over the line, no one really knows that is a hundred too much is 150. That sounds like a little too much. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, there is some, the bottom line, it has to be a membership model. You can't bill insurance and, and it should be affordable for most people. That's the way we kind of define it. What do you see as the biggest barrier to DPC growing at this point? Is it the fact that most people are still getting their healthcare through insurance networks? And so for them, it's an added expense, you know, outside of insurance. I mean, that's what it is for me. I was, when I first signed up, I actually was on a health share minister, ministry sharing plan and I've now got insurance again, but anyway, that's kind of a long, a different story, but anyway, uh, so I just kept my doctor and, and we have that anyway, it's a great service, but do you think that's the main barrier right now for most people? Well, have two, the two barriers are that physicians who, who don't want to jump into it because you have to go from a salary to spending money to making no money, you know, not, you know, to, to yeah, make sure. the risk. Money. So that's that, ri that risk is a barrier on the physician side. And so that's one side. The, the patient side is they don't, they don't understand that they're hooked on a model uh, that is, that is absolutely, they're addicted to, to insurance. And so they think it's, a great thing and they're realizing it's costly and then they're realizing they're covering less and less but they think they have to have that now they they have to have something for catastrophic we we all need something and i, I don't mind even against if that was national some kind of catastrophic coverage but then the rest let us shop or let people shop around for their health care where the best shoppers you know in the world amazon proven that in, in their you know just a regular amazon market because uh in the, in the long run, I think you do save money most of the time with direct primary care. If you go three or four times a year and get any labs done, you've saved money by doing us. Uh, insurance is paying less and less. I mean, they, they may not pay for anything of your, they pay for a glucose, fasting glucose and a fasting lipid panel. They're done. Okay. I find this laughable too, because I'm a big advocate of like good RX, right? So I can try to get you a cheaper medication. Uh, okay, so then I'm finding more and more that insurance is covering no medicine. They were realizing people are shopping and getting and getting cheaper medicines of good erect. They're like, we'll just cover nothing. And charge I mean, the same. <laughs> they're not covering anything. So you're paying cash for your medicines. You're getting less and less from these insurance companies. And so, and that's because they shouldn't be, and they're not a healthcare provider. They call themselves a healthcare provider. So do your commercials for hospitals. As your healthcare provider, uh, blank health, you know, hospital, you're not, it's the doctors and nurses that are healthcare providers, right? So, so the, the, 
insurance model is what is, yes, that is the number one barrier because people just don't understand how freaking bad it is and how costly and what little you're getting for your money. Um, you still have to have something, but where did it go? Where did the major, major medical go 40 years ago where it was just catastrophic? Why, why couldn't that, where, where's the commercials where it says, uh, where you where say, take 15 minutes to save 15% of your health insurance? Where right. are those commercials, right? I mean, it's a scam out there. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, that, and, and unfortunately, that confuses patients. And uh, we're, we, we try to really truly educate. And so when and I teach everybody else, I mean, no patient should join your practice without meet and greet. So they truly understand what they're getting into. And they ask that question, why do I need you plus insurance? And I would say, listen, you go to a doctor office, it'll be $150 of me a visit. It's a copay. Any procedures, they'll, they'll, they'll charge you a lot of money for. If I take a mole off you, it's free. If I drain your cyst, it's free. If I put an injection into you, it's free. Um, I'll see you when I need uh, immediately. You know, if, if you need to come back for a second problem or you want to just stay longer, we can do either way, but it doesn't cost you anymore. So you, you kind of work on your pitch, which I think is totally legitimate of, of and you're a salesman. We're all salesmen and we sell ourselves because we really believe we have a great product. Yeah. So when you're seeing, are, do you see lots of uh, new residents and medical students? I mean, at least now when I... W- 10 years ago, not even 10 years, let's say five years ago, when I talk about it, a medical student, I had three heads, right? When I used to talk about direct primary care, they never heard of it. I feel like now they've heard of it or they're aware of it. And so something has shifted and changed. At least people, at least kids are aware of it, whether they want to actually do it or not. Yeah, that's an entirely different question. But do you, are you seeing that too now? At least more physicians yeah. are oh, yeah. like much, looking at it? Much more. When I started, it's in my book actually. And I did a talk at the residency. Yeah, they were, none of them, they thought it was illegal. They <laughs> <laughs> getting paid no, to work. <laughs> no idea. No idea. And now I get, I was getting tons of residents and medical students shadowing me by the end and it still continues today. So that's no, it's, it's, if, listen, this is the thing that drives me crazy. With the, and I, I've had my ups and downs with the American Academy of Failure Practice, but I, I, I beg them to ask one question, the one question to all their members, just one question. If your practice, if I can guarantee you, which I can't, but if I guarantee your practice was filled tomorrow, so you won't have to worry about going into debt. Filled tomorrow with DPC model, where you're only seeing six to eight patients a day, you're making as much as you have now, no, no coding, no billing, no metrics. Um, would you take that job on versus what you have now? And how many, I would say 99% would probably say yes, they yeah. would do that. So why don't you ask that question? Because if you ask that question and 99% say yes, why wouldn't you then make a model or figure out how do you get from A to B? Because that's where everybody wants to go. Right. They all want to go DPC. That was what I'm saying. And I just think it's going to take some time, but we're not getting much, as much help as we, we should be getting. Do you think the academies are the ones stopping it in some ways? And or I mean, I I, they're, they're, they're definitely like I've seen conferences hosted by the family practice. They definitely yes. have yeah. the models. Is it just because they're they don't understand it? I mean, people who are hosting conferences are you know academics, maybe, for instance. And so they are, you know, they're not in that sort of model anyway. Well, there is there is some. Okay, so they are t- 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 they're reactive to what's in their um, pool of members. And most of their members, 90% plus, are not doing DPC. So they're sure. going to do mostly that. And, and so I, I think I, I, I do have some uh, feelings they're making money off the industrialized model as well, whether it's teaching you how to fix your burnout or teaching you how to code right or teaching you how to do all that stuff. So I'm not sure that there is some conflict of interest there. I don't think we're high priority right now. Uh, this has to be grassroots roots. And I mean, listen, we, uh, we went to the, uh, uh, the AFP conference and kind of like broke in and had a party to get people to go. I mean, we did it just to, uh, and I think it kind of pissed them off a little bit, but because it has to be done that way. It has to be only done guerrilla style to show people there is another way. How do you tell people about the matrix if you're in the matrix, right? right. So so it's going to take time. And, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be long gone before th- that, you know, maybe it's, 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 it's main, totally mainstream, but I, I hopefully I can be a part of that, moving it that way. So now that you've been retired almost almost a year now, October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're getting there. We're June. We're mid June, mid to late June at this point. Eight months. Eight months. Yeah. yeah. And now actually the pandemic's over for the most part. Yeah. Um, where do you what do you see yourself doing? It. You're obviously advocating with DPC News. 
what other yeah. things are you doing besides, you know, having fun golfing and playing softball as we were talking about earlier yeah. <laughs> before you were recording? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, you know, I've written through those three books. I've written three other books. My, my latest book is a, is a fictional book called Noki. It's about uh, autistic boxers. It's a, long, it's a really great story. I'm, I'm proud of that book. I, I see myself writing so uh, more like that. I enjoy doing that. I enjoy uh, the DPC. It, 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 my friends are mostly DPC doctors, so that I can't see myself uh, uh, losing that. And then I'm just going to go with the flow. And and I like. I mean, I, I have a, I've invented two different products. So if something comes up, I have no. I don't have any regimen or plan where I. I probably need to do that more. Where I you know have quiet space and kind of just think, but. Well, I have my office here, but I, I, when things come to me, I, I, I have you know, guys like me, I'm not go like this. Right. And so, you know, it'll hit a surge of creativity or something will hit and then I'm lost and I'm gone in that world for a while. Then I'll come back. And right now I know I'm a little bit of a lull. So I, something's probably coming soon, but I have no specific plans. I mean, I have, I'll visit my kids who live different parts of the country. And, um, and, and so I, I, I'm happy as a clam, love medicine. Uh, I, part of me is sad when I start losing some of my knowledge uh, base about it. And, um, and I miss some of my patients and, um, but, but it was time um, and we'll see where this takes me. <laughs> Finally, with DPC Alliance, wh where is that organization? Well, I mean, now that you actually can do stuff, right? Because now you can yeah. actually host events. What are, you, what are you guys up to for the next you know, year? Is there stuff going on that conferences and things like that? So, so I helped, I came up with actually the idea. Uh, I'm so proud that we actually all came together. No one makes money in an organization other than the, Joe Grundy, who's a hired, uh, basically runs the company uh, because we need somebody, but no, all the physicians are volunteer. It's nonprofit. Everybody in DPC should join the DPC Alliance because there's a ton of knowledge based stuff there. Um, DPC Alliance runs mastermind weekends, at least uh, probably six to 10 a year where you can uh, uh, go and, and spend time with DPC docs. They also help out with the uh, DPC summit, which is in, in collusion with the AFP. So that's why I get mad, people get mad at me if I rip on the AFP, but it's another story in itself. But I do believe in the DPC summit and I do believe there's some, there are some good people, you really are good people at AFP who believe in DPC. So, and they're involved with this. So the DPC summit comes up, I think this next month. Uh, in the future, that'll be live. This one's again virtual, and I'll go to. I don't do virtual conferences. I'll go to the live one and and, and uh, have fun with that. I expect that conference to get bigger and bigger. Um, the the one there's two pieces that are missing, and uh, in, in, and we haven't figured this out. We need a bed, better a patient educational model to get patients, because that creates demand for more DPC doctors. Right, right. We need that. I don't want to do that. Uh, DPC news is enough for me. I, I, I hope I don't have to get forced into that in some manner. Um, so that uh, that is one um, uh, piece that needs to be fixed. And there are two organizations that are involved in lobbying. So I'm not sure if I don't think I, I, DPC Alliance won't do that, which is good. But I do they do think they need to be the voice. So I don't want if some if Newsweek wants to hear about direct primary care, I don't want them hopefully ever going to the AFP. They should go to the DPC Alliance, and that needs to be known, so that they're the mouthpiece. And I'm not involved in any way other than I'm a, I'm grandfathered in as a permanent member because of that uh, some of the things I've done. But I'm not even on the board right now. But the people on the board are freaking awesome. The people running it: Julie Gunther, Vance Lassie. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, Kissy Blackwell. I mean, these are brilliant DPC doctors giving a ton of their time uh, to, to just move the movement forward. I think that's awesome. Well, Dr. Frigo, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I wish you the best of success in your retirement and doing other things. And I'm sure we'll, we'll run into each other, you know, yeah. actually in person for once, which would be kind of nice. I, it'd be cool if you ever go to the, any of the masterminds, if you ever go to a DPC conference or Maybe there's some other, uh, you know, the, the stuff you're doing with this podcast and great job with that. As I, I think this is awesome. Uh, what are they doing for po podcast conferences? Do you go to those kind of things? Is that something that intrigues you? Because I'm, I'm not going to ever do one. I'm just curious. They have they have them for like national ones. I don't believe there's one for, for medicine. We I'm actually part of the Doctor Podcast Network now. So there are oh, a lot cool. of us. And so I suppose, I mean, it got formed during, you know, the pandemic. So I don't know. I, I think at some point we probably need to get, get together. Yeah. I, I feel like most of the, physician for podcasts are selling stuff. 
I don't sell anything except I guess I run an ad, but I mean, outside of that, I don't, I don't actually, I'm not selling myself. I'm not selling my services. I just, I find, I think I like to think that we're looking at medicine and, and various things in the healthcare sphere and yeah. things are disruptive and trying to get people informed and learn about stuff. And, you know, maybe someone wants to do something about it. I, it's, I'm amazed like as you are about the energy some people have and their creativity and ability to solve problems. Yeah. And, and that's what I just find. It, I'd love just talking to those people because I, I, in that way, I'm not at all creative <laughs> to solve these problems. Uh, I, so I see everybody, the roadblock and I don't see the way around and they do. Everybody has their niche. And trust me, if anybody has um, uh, superpowers in one area, they're lacking in somewhere else. I, 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 I'm just telling you, that's the thing. You know, that's why I tell you this. Is yeah. that, you know, uh, my wife will ha- has to compensate for a lot of crap that I cannot do. That's why she's involved in DPC News because I'm, there's gaps that that i am missing but i hope we do get to meet each other someday in, in person well thanks again i appreciate okay. it thanks again to dr frigo for a really fun discussion on apple and tech and dpc but before we end don't forget to reach out to larry keller of physician financial services for your disability insurance needs he's been around for a while and many physician communities helping them with their coverage they need find larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash larry keller <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash The Paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.